Right now, Representative Matt Gates is winning by 21, although the race has not been called yet. And Matt Gates joins us now. Welcome, Matt. Oh, thanks for having me, Cenk. I think ABC News and CNN have both called my race. Couldn't have been too easy for them, but sure glad to see the voters come out for me. All right. So, Representative Gates, uh, if the Republicans win the House tonight, uh, what is your strategy going forward? What will you emphasize in the next term? I think it's all the eyes. I think it's inflation, immigration, and investigations. And we have a mandate now to try to limit spending. Uh, I think also people are very concerned about what's happening on the border. And when it comes to the weaponization of this government against our people, folks want to see the FBI, the Department of Justice, called to heal and called to account. That used to be something that liberals actually stood for, civil liberties and stopping the excesses of the politicization of investigations. And now the Republicans that will be leading the House Judiciary Committee will have that as our central focus. So um, inflation being high, you mentioned it first. Um, obviously, wages is a very large issue. So yeah. do you think that we should raise the minimum wage so that the American people's salaries can keep up with the raising the rising costs of, of all the goods uh, that they're having to deal with? So the time when we saw rising wages was really during the Trump presidency. I don't believe that government mandated minimum wages are actually the way to increase real wages. Actually, a lot of economists say that raising the minimum wage can be inflationary. Our strategy to tackle inflation will focus on cutting government spending, not having a regime that pays people not to work. I think able-bodied, childless adults should be subject to work requirements. Previously, when Republican states have tried to do that, Democrat administrations haven't allowed them to, haven't issued appropriate waivers. And so if we can legislate work requirements into government funding bills, I think that'll be a, a good counter pressure on inflation. All right, so raising wages, not what you're planning to do to counter inflation. Got it. Anna. No, we raise wages. I just don't think the way to raise wages is a government mandated minimum wage increase. So how would wages increase uh, out of the kindness of corporations' hearts uh, who have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders and keep doing corporate stock buybacks and uh, dividends for their shareholders? No fan of big corporations. I think the biggest threat to our liberty is big government. The second biggest threat to big, big corporations. And probably the third would be homeowners associations. But I do think that during the Trump era, we saw wages rise as a consequence of capital investment and the onshoring of cash that was largely pushed offshore to preserve intellectual property assets and revenue streams. And if we allowed more of that capital to come back into our country again, I think we would do a lot to see the investment in the workforce. Look, if you go around any district, Republican or Democrat right now, the number one issue for a lot of small businesses is just how to get people to show up to work. And when you have a government that pays able-bodied people not to work, it really cuts against the ambitions and interests and dreams of a lot of the small businesses that are the backbone of our country. Okay, can you can you please be specific about what you're referring to when you say a government that pays people not to work? And and be specific in regard to numbers. Uh, how, how much money are Americans allegedly getting paid by the government to sit home and not work? Well, during the pandemic era, people got checks. and When there I were shutdowns, when companies were shut down, yes. Right, but all of that was inflationary. And I also think that when you provide government benefits to able-bodied childless adults, like Medicaid, like childcare, like transportation, like cell phones, uh, then you, you create in the economy a bubble. And when that bubble bursts, a lot of working class people, folks that liberals actually used to stand up for, those folks get crushed and hammered when they go to the grocery store, when they go to the gas station. I also think Republicans are going to have a pretty big energy bill. Now, I'm not a drill everywhere, drill anywhere kind of guy. I think we've got to be smart and strategic, but certainly we want to see the Keystone Pipeline reopen. We want to see more of the fracking and shale development in the interior of the country. And I think that just reducing energy prices will do a great deal to lower inflation because you see those energy prices baked in at every layer of the supply chain. Well, I think that's a, it's a common myth that's uh, repeated over and over again by both the press and the Republican Party. We are the top oil and gas producer in the world. We're also the top exporter of oil and gas. 
because uh, yeah. our natural resources are completely owned by private corporations who get to sell those natural resources to the highest bidder. So if you're actually genuinely concerned about keeping gas prices low at the pump, we could nationalize our oil and gas. Would you be willing to do that? No, I don't know that the Venezuela energy model is one that the American people are voting for. Okay, so you want to allow corporations to no, no, no. export no, think, uh, oil and gas to the highest bidders internationally. Now, I think we should repeal the Jones Act because you're right, there is production that's up, but as a consequence of the Jones Act, we're not able to actually get that energy to the places that we need it so that there's broad distribution and lower prices. So actually, there's a deregulation answer that I think would unlock lower prices for the American people given what we currently produce. Um, I wanted to just quickly, Jenk, one follow up and then I'll, I'll let you take over. The, the point that you made about social services like Medicaid, which provides health care to literally the most impoverished people in the country, how exactly do you claim that that leads to inflation? I mean, I can explain how the Federal Reserve engaging in quantitative easing, literally printing money and giving it to banks and corporations, who then turned around and invested in their own stocks and did dividends and all that. That definitely led to asset bubbles, the private equity firms buying up entire neighborhoods of single family homes based on the money that was given to them by the Federal Reserve. That led, led to inflation in the housing market. I want you to explain exactly how Medicaid leads to inflation. Well, first of all, I agree with you regarding those corporate excesses. I am one of the people on Thomas Massey's bill to audit the Fed for the very reasons you laid out. I think the Fed has become a distribution system for corporate welfare, and then that cuts against working class Americans. But when you have people who aren't working, but who are still able to get child care, health care, not as a consequence of being poor or sick or infirm or elderly, but just because of the Medicaid expansion that was ushered in through Obamacare, I think that is inflationary because then people don't have to go out and spend cash and have a real economic exchange for the services that they're receiving, often as a result of government largesse. So what I've heard so far is that giving people child care, health care, and higher wages is leading to inflation, and you guys are going to try to tackle inflation so that what I'm hearing from you is lower wages, less child care, less health care. That sounds perfectly Republican things. Jake, it's not just the government that can do these things. There are private sector solutions as well. If people make more money, if the economy is growing at a faster rate, like it did under President Trump, then I do think we would be able to achieve those objectives. But government spending is inflationary. That is the central covenant of this election that we're going through that Republicans are very likely to win across the country. People want to see less government spending. Now, I don't think we ought to cut government spending for disabled people like my mother, for seniors. I don't want to touch Social Security or Medicare, but specifically with the Obamacare Medicaid expansion, you have able-bodied people who could go to work, but who choose not to, and I don't think we should provide those things for them. Right. So we clearly have a different point of view. We see uh, corporations uh, with record profits continuing to drive prices up. There's uh, exit polling showing that 83% of the voters wanted the government to do something about that. Instead, they have let, us, let uh, those corporations gouge and gouge and gouge us over and over again as Republicans protected them. But to be fair, so did Biden. So now uh, I want to move on to one of the things that we're most concerned about, which is Jack, Jack, democracy. I crossed, uh, oh, hold on. I crossed the aisle and joined with Democrat David Cicilline to actually utilize antitrust tools to go after the very type of corporate greed that you're talking about. I'm actually hoping to persuade more people in this incoming Republican majority that the way to govern is not to just give the lobby corps the power. I'm the only Republican in Congress who doesn't take any money from any lobbyists or any PACs full stop. And so I actually think there could be common ground with Democrats. So if we can get the Biden Justice Department to actually be serious about the enforcement of antitrust laws, I actually think we could do a lot to curb that corporate greed. So look, uh, we're a fair show. So the, uh, it's obvious that we disagree with you on a lot of things and we got more coming up in a second. But it is true that you don't take that corporate PAC money and like the corporate uh, people on the left that don't take the corporate PAC money. Take you, any PAC money, not just corporate yeah. PAC money, no ideological PAC money, right. no leadership PAC money. And I, I stand alone as a Republican on that front. That's right. And that's what allows you to criticize big business, whereas a lot of almost all of your colleagues serve big business, by the way, including Rick Scott, who has promised to cut Social Security and Medicare in the same state of Florida. Now, 
we're worried about democracy, Matt. And, demo and in 2020, Trump clearly lost the election. He then did 60 court cases, he and his allies, uh, and he could not present one piece of evidence. And he still insisted on lying about how he had won the election. So can you just be honest for once and say that Donald Trump definitely lost the 2020 election? Joe Biden is definitely the president. I think there are a lot of irregularities there that still people are concerned about. But a big mistake that Democrats made in this election was talking so much about the last election. Look, Democrats went all in on this democracy message, and it's going to get crushed nationwide. It's going to lose, not because people don't like democracy, but because people believe that Joe Biden and Democrats are engaging in threat construction around democracy as a substitute for an economic plan, for something that will actually result in people making more money, growing their businesses. So I don't think that Katrina yeah. obsess about this is going to be politically helpful for Democrats. And by the way, I don't think democracy is in any jeopardy. We've, we've had a record turnout for a midterm election today. And that seems to show that a democracy in our country is alive well and certainly something that I support wholeheartedly. Hold, hold I, on, guys. I, yeah. I, I have breaking news while we're talking to Matt Gates. Uh, New York Times has just called your race. Matt Gates has won uh, in his district in Florida uh, right now as we speak to him. Uh, and I, I did notice, though, uh, Representative Gates, that you evaded the question. Uh, you said that Biden is president. You didn't say Biden uh, won the election. He obviously did. And you know it. But I'll move on. Anna. No, hold on. I got a I got a follow up question to something you said. You know, you just made a vague statement about some irregularities. There are some irregularities. And, you know, you were one of the individuals who pushed the, the lie that the election was stolen from Trump. So be specific. What are the so-called irregularities? Because the Trump camp failed to provide a shred of evidence indicating that there was widespread voter fraud. Yet you and other Trump allies continued repeating that the election was stolen from him. Uh, so be specific. What exactly are you referring to? I'm really concerned about some of these urban areas that operate <laughs> under an entirely different system than the rest of their states. For example, in Wayne County, Michigan, the mechanism by which ballots are assembled is totally different than in the other parts of the state. And I don't think that volume alone justifies that. I also think that in Pennsylvania, a major irregularity was the, unit, was the change in the way that ballots were mailed out. In time after time, you saw secretaries of state take unilateral action to go and engage in this broad distribution of ballots. I think that is ripe for fraud, and I don't think that it was constitutional. Now, Cheng made an important point about the 60 The courts weighed in on that, though, right? Yep. Yeah, I want to get to that, because almost all of those cases, not all, but almost all of those cases were resolved in the absence of an evidentiary hearing. So it's not exactly fair to say that like we true. lost because we didn't have sufficient evidence. And a lot of them were decided on jurisdictional grounds and on the sufficiency of the pleadings, not based on an actual evidentiary hearing where both sides got to put information before the court. So it's a little, I think, misleading to no, suggest no, that no, like, no. 60 it's, hearings around the country where so, evidence was presented. That, that no, was really Matt, bad. some were uh, uh, decided on jurisdictional grounds, but the uh, majority were uh, decided on the merits, and every judge, including every Republican judge, including every Trump-appointed judge, said, you have not presented any evidence, including the evidence that you were just talking about now, when in, when in court there was none, zero. And by the way, Matt, you can tell from your answers, you don't believe it either. It's super <laughs> obvious you don't believe it. But yeah, I can tell by your questions, you guys still have no message because instead of talking about how we're going to actually move the country forward, you guys are still obsessed about the 2020 No, election. Matt, Matt, it's, I'm not a regular Democrat. Still I don't care about their, their messaging. What I care about is if your friend Donald Trump wins in 2024, we might never have another election because he's an obvious pathological liar, doesn't believe in democracy, didn't want to leave even though he lost the election, and you know it. Jake, the last time you were on the ballot, you got 4% of the vote. So for you, so what? What does that have to do with anything that, that we're talking anything? about right now? Okay, Matt, if we're going in that direction, that you guys might listen, not you had sex with a 17-year-old, according to allegations, uh, well, and what? you asked for a pardon. Hold on. You, you asked for a pardon. You asked. 
the pardon? Why did you ask for the pardon? Yeah, why did you ask Trump for a pardon if you didn't break any laws? I've been overwhelmingly reelected. You guys are in some sort of weird struggle session there, and I'm just glad, even though the internet hated you having me on, Cenk, you're getting to see what a congressional victory party looks like, and that's something that might be a novel experience. Why did you ask for a pardon for having sex with a 17 year old? even happened. You're like reading into an anonymous internet conspiracy. And it's really sad because in my district, the voters saw through that. In my state, we're over. Did you ask for the pardon? That, that has all been debunked. I've addressed it. President Trump has addressed it. And by the way, you should look at your own comments about women that caused Bernie Sanders to unendorse you. Imagine being so aligned with Bernie Sanders that he would endorse you, but he has to pull his endorsement because the things that you said were so yeah. Insane. Well, Matt, see, some people grow up and they change. Others uh, send send their colleagues in Congress nude photos of women that they've slept with today and uh, are hated by members of their own party, which uh, there are numerous reports about that. Regarding you know, keep so, but I do appreciate you coming on to answer our questions. People have told those lies Did you are going to be. They were not lies, in, uh, Matt. You know it. You, a, dude, it's no wonder you guys don't have the trust of the voters because you guys sit here and just spew this nonsense that isn't relevant to people's lives. We're going to focus on inflation. We're going to focus on the border. We're going to focus on investigations. And the result is we're going to win in 2024. Democracy will be fine and you guys will still be crying on the young turn. Did, did you, you never answered the question, did you sleep with the 17? Absolutely not. That has been totally debunked. And by the way, more women have made accusations against Joe Biden that have made accusations against me. We've talked about them. You should be really proud of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. my number is zero. You can't even keep Bernie Sanders' endorsement, and Joe Biden doesn't exactly have a clean record himself. So we're pretty happy here in the Sunshine State. One Miami-Dade County, one my district. Looks like the House and Senate will flip, and eager to get to Washington to get to work. Yeah. Uh, by the way, there was one difference uh, between us. The Democratic Party did not support me because I uh, am against their corruption. Whereas you kissed the ass of the Republican leaders 24-7, so they were very Bernie. happy to support Chang, you. You couldn't even hold Bernie. He endorsed you and had to unendorse you. Like, do you think Bernie is yeah. also on the establishment of the Democratic Party? He's not even a Democrat, and he left you on the side of the road with your 4% of the vote. Matt, I don't care about my personal career at all. I told really? Bernie to do that. I actually wanted Bernie to win that election really badly, and I didn't want to get in his way because I care about policies. I care about higher wages. I care about everybody in the country getting health insurance. I care about them getting paid family leave. I care about them getting child tax credit. And what I heard from you tonight is when you guys win, you're not going to do anything about wages. You're, you're going to make sure that people do not get any help in the categories that I just mentioned. No, so wages will go in the, the real evil is Medicaid, to be fair. The, guys the real evil in the country is Medicaid. And now Got the to American people are going to get something in the Republican majority. All right, Matt Gates, uh, thank you for joining us. We appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This is fun.